By the end of the 1960s, NASA was prepared to send astronauts beyond Earth orbit, pushing hard to reach the moon, but they were taking risks that today would be unthinkable. In October 1968, a Saturn V began inching its way to Cape Kennedy's Launch Complex 39, Pad A. There had been two previous Saturn V launches, but this one, Apollo 8, would be the first to carry a crew. Originally intended as a manned test of the lunar module in Earth orbit, Flight objectives were radically readjusted when a lunar module could not be ready in time. The flight crew was changed too. Jim Lovell was the command module pilot. And though there was no lunar module, Bill Anders was the designated lunar module pilot. Frank Borman would command the revamped mission. The original Apollo 8 astronauts were moved to Apollo 9. They would be the first men to leave Earth orbit and fly around the moon, and these astronauts had had very little time to retrain for this new mission. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have lift off. Lift at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the tower. On the previous Saturn V, harmonic vibration had caused the early shutdown of two engines. Action taken to rectify the problem saw a flawless launch for Apollo 8. Eleven and a half minutes after launch, the spacecraft, still attached to the upper stage, achieved orbit, with both the ground staff and space crew entering an intense period of system checking. This was a risky mission. A less public reason it had been brought forward came from the CIA. Intelligence suggested that Russia was preparing a lunar orbital mission. Power 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Power 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. TLI, Translunar Injection. Soon after, the S-4B upper stage fired, pushing Apollo 8 out of Earth orbit toward the moon. Now, a new problem arose. Frank Borman began to feel sick and threw up which was even more unpleasant in zero gravity. Because of the attitude of the spacecraft, they could not see the moon, but through the round window, they began seeing more and more of the Earth. Soon they would be the first people to see our planet in its entirety. However, this window soon fogged with gas from the oils in the chemical sealant. Apollo 7 had also suffered from this problem. As Apollo 8 approached the moon, the crew prepared for an engine burn that would place the craft in lunar orbit. The main engine had to fire for four minutes when the command module was behind the moon, out of radio contact. This was the first time that the crew got a decent view of the moon. William Anders prepared to photograph the lunar surface. 
An important part of the mission was to document areas such as the Sea of Tranquility in preparation for future lunar landings. Then on the fourth orbit, they saw something astounding. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? After this mission, it was often said that they went to the moon and discovered the Earth. Get a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh man, that's crazy. Where is it? Quick. After 10 orbits of the moon, Apollo 8 fired its main engine and began its return right to Earth. Just grab me a color. A color exterior. Yeah. During its cruise back, Bill Anders captured more pictures of the Earth. The Apollo 8 astronauts returned as heroes. Their flight around the moon had put NASA's space effort back on the front pages. But it was the end of 1968, and there was only one year left to reach the moon within President Kennedy's deadline. Just two months later, Russell Schweikart, Dave Scott, and Commander Jim McDivitt were preparing for the next Apollo mission. Apollo 9 would be the first test of the complete Apollo system. Till now, the lunar module had made only one flight when it was tested without a crew. This would be the first time two spacecraft had been launched together. And, like all Apollo missions, it would be far more complex than the mission that had preceded it. A February launch had been delayed to March the 3rd, 1969, to allow the crew to recover from a virus they had contracted. Though Apollo 9 would remain in Earth orbit, the crew faced a punishing schedule. Not only would they be the first to fly the lunar module, but a spacewalk had been planned to test the new self-contained life support system. After reaching orbit, the command and service module separated from the S-4B upper stage that carried the lunar module. They docked with the lunar lander to withdraw it from the S-4B. After separation, Apollo 9 backed away to a safe distance and ground control sent the discarded stage on a course towards the sun. The next few days were spent in manoeuvres, with the main engine being fired five times, changing the orbit in preparation for testing of the lunar module and to simulate mid-course corrections that would be needed on a trip to the moon. The crew had removed the hatches and probes to clear the connecting tunnel between the command module and the lunar module that had been named Gumdrop and Spider. These were the first NASA craft to be named since Gemini 3's Molly Brown. Every aspect of the linked spacecraft was closely monitored in mission control. Soon, McDivitt and Schweikart would fly in a machine that had no capability of returning to the ground and nothing could go wrong. In case something did go wrong and the two craft could not dock again, a spacewalk had been planned to test an outside transfer between Spider and Gumdrop. This was the Apollo program's first spacewalk, and Rusty Schweikart was only connected by a nylon tether. All his oxygen and electrical power came from the portable life support system he wore on his back. Okay, Dave, come on out. Both spacecraft had been depressurized, and while Schweikart was busy at the lunar module, Dave Scott was retrieving an experimental sample from the yeah, outside of the command sample? module. This spacewalk was cut short because Schweikart was suffering from space sickness. Okay, we're nice and stable with respect to you. The next day, Spider and Gumdrop separated for the first time. It's a nice looking machine. So is yours. Using its descent engine, Spider, the lunar module, withdrew to a distance of around 150 kilometers. The next time Dave Scott in the command module saw the lunar module, it had jettisoned its lower descent stage. All engine tests for both stages had worked well, and NASA was developing confidence in their new moon craft. 
Before redocking with the command module, McDivitt and Schweikart did a complex series of pirouettes to allow Scott to inspect Spider from every angle. When the three astronauts were reunited, the lunar module was jettisoned, eventually to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. They spent several more days in orbit, photographing the Earth before splashing down in the Atlantic. NASA had just nine more months to meet President Kennedy's end of the decade deadline for putting a man on the moon, but there was one more step before they made the first attempt to land. Oh, our stage is pressurized. Apollo 10 would take a lunar module to the moon and descend toward the lunar surface, but it would not land. In keeping with NASA's very tight schedule, it had a long list of questions to answer, and the mission would have the most experienced crew of any Apollo mission so far. Lunar module pilot Gene Cernan had flown on Gemini 9. Command module pilot John Young had flown on Gemini 3 and 10. And Commander Tom Stafford had flown on Gemini 6 and 9. One of the important problems that this mission had to solve was linked with the Moon's uneven gravitation. Previous manned and unmanned lunar orbital missions had discovered that variable concentrations of mass within the Moon had caused lunar orbits to be erratic. NASA needed to map these irregularities to fully understand how their spacecraft would perform in lunar orbit. Nine. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on. Five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. Apollo 10 would be a complete rehearsal for the first lunar landing. It would be the second Apollo craft to leave Earth orbit. Docking with and extraction of the lunar module, which had been the major focus of previous missions, was becoming commonplace. Again, it's looking real stable to us. We show you close and finally. Roger. That snap and we're there. Got two grays. Roger. Apollo 10 was the first spacecraft to make color television transmissions and they pulled in audiences of around one billion. Do whatever he says. As in the previous mission, Apollo 10 had two spacecraft each needing a different call sign. The astronauts had elected to call the mothership Charlie Brown and the lunar module Snoopy after the popular Peanuts cartoon strip of the time. After this, the space crews were asked to choose names that had a little more gravitas. When they disappeared behind the moon, they fired the main engine for six minutes, which the astronauts described as being interminable. The craft went into lunar orbit as planned, and six hours later, Stafford and Cernan entered Snoopy to prepare it for descent toward the lunar surface. It was teeming with weightless flakes of mylar insulation that had come loose when the connecting tunnel had pressurized. This caused itching for the rest of the flight. But there were more problems. Charlie Brown, Houston, uh, we're concerned about this yaw bias uh, in the limb and uh, apparent slippage of the uh, docking ring. We'd like you to uh, disable... The lunar module was more than three degrees out of alignment with the command module, and air pressure in the tunnel between the two craft could not be released. Houston was worried that undocking now could damage the latches that held them together. Engineers on the ground decided that anything less than six degrees was not a problem, and Snoopy was given the all clear to undock. Mm -hmm. 
This was the first time a lunar module had flown in the lunar environment for which it had been designed. Mission planners were concerned that Stafford and Cernan might try to seize the opportunity to make an unauthorised landing, so Snoopy had been short fueled If they did land, they could not get back. For the next eight hours, John Young would be alone in Charlie Brown. Houston, Houston. Charlie Brown, how do you read on high gate? Over. Charlie Brown, Houston, over. Roger, read your last clear. Uh, Snoopy was go for DOI. Roger, great. Sounds great. We copy. Snoopy dropped lower and lower, passing directly over the proposed landing site for the next Apollo mission and travelling more than 500 kilometres from the mothership. But just before they were due to jettison the descent stage, a guidance setting switch was in the wrong mode and the lunar module began gyrating wildly. By dumping the descent stage and switching to manual control, Tom Stafford was able to regain stability. Charlie, how was the stage? Good, huh? Wait till that thing blinks. Charlie Brown, uh, Houston, they got hey, staging. Uh, they uh, had a wild uh, gyration, though, but they got it under control. Over. The rendezvous went according to plan, and Apollo 10 remained in lunar orbit for another 29 hours, mapping anomalies in the lunar gravity before returning to the Earth. But even as they were near the moon, another Saturn V had been rolled out to the launch pad. Apollo 11 was being prepared for the first attempt at a landing on the moon. Europe begins testing a new concept re-entry vehicle. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage de ZAP. ESA, the European Space Agency, launches light, medium and heavy lift rockets from its facility in French Guiana. But it has no ability to bring vehicles back through the Earth's atmosphere for a safe landing. The Intermediate Experimental Vehicle, or IXV, is being developed so that ESA can master the techniques of controlled re-entry from low Earth orbit. The IXV uses the lifting body concept in combination with ceramic and carbon fibre thermal protection. Though this is a more complex technique than the common ablative heat shield made of plastic resin that dissipates heat as it vaporises, ESA wants to test a vehicle that offers greater control for more accuracy in landing. The concept vehicle will function autonomously. It is equipped with thrusters to maintain the correct attitude before it reaches the Earth's atmosphere. As it descends to 120 kilometres, the IXV encounters the upper levels of the atmosphere. At this point, it is travelling at a speed approaching 27,000 kilometres per hour. Two flat actuators keep the craft correctly aligned during this part of the re-entry. There are unanswered questions about this part of the journey where the oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the air become a high temperature plasma that does not obey the usual rules of aerodynamics. At an altitude of 26 kilometres, the craft will have slowed to 1,600 kilometres per hour, where the first of a series of supersonic parachutes is deployed. Though this technology is well understood, ESA still had to perform drop tests in the Mediterranean of a dummy IXV to see how their craft would behave. 
In mid-2014, the craft was prepared for its flight from the European spaceport in Kourou. The IXV was covered in more than 300 sensors to monitor its behaviour during all phases of its two-hour flight. Quatre, trois, deux, un, top. Allumage P80, décollage. It will be six months before the technical data has been fully understood and can be used in the design of a larger re-entry vehicle. What do you do when two brand new satellites go missing? For more than 15 years, Europe has been working on its own satellite navigation system. Called Galileo, the system is intended as a civilian global location service as an alternative to the American GPS, which has military applications. This means average GPS users can have their service downgraded without notice. An in-orbit validation phase using four satellites was recently completed and new additions are being launched regularly until a constellation of 30 satellites is in service. Satellites 5 and 6, known as Dorisa and Melena, were sent up on August the 21st, 2014, aboard a Soyuz launcher. Initially, everything seemed to have gone well, but a design flaw in the Frigat upper stage allowed fuel lines to freeze during the extended cruise, and the satellites were delivered to elliptical rather than circular orbits. It took a while just to find where Dorisa and Milena were, and then ground staff began the detailed calculations involved in bringing the satellites back to usable positions. The low end of the orbit took both satellites through the Van Allen radiation belts, endangering the sensitive navigational electronics. Using the satellite's own manoeuvring thrusters, they were brought into usable circular orbits. After exhaustive systems checks, Dorisa and Milena were given a clean bill of health and, though their positions are not ideal, they will still be able to contribute to the Galileo constellation's function. Soon, the next two satellites, Adam and Anastasia, will go into orbit although their launch has been delayed by a thorough review of the Soyuz and its Frigat upper stage. It has been determined that the proximity of a cold helium line to the fuel line caused the freezing problem in the Frigat. <laughs> 